I mean, everybody told me people were saying F off. Jimmy Kimmel's sister told me to kill myself. She said F off and die. If I was really, truly, truly doing that, I would deserve all those things. Kat, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Guys, so Kat's new book is You Can't Joke About That. And I have to tell you, I really enjoyed this book. I get a lot of book pitches and everything. But this one stood out and I wanted to check it out. And I actually, once I did, I finished it in like two days because <laughs> the mix of like really revealing and, and brave personal stuff to put out there with your cultural and political commentary. Um, I guess first, the first question I have to ask you is, what is it like to be a woman in comedy? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I did read I'm, the book. Yeah, I'm, I'm right. I, for context, guys, I'm just messing with her. That's a, yeah, exactly. a question she says she hates to be asked. It is a question I hate to be asked because you like that implies that that's the most fascinating thing about co your comedy is that you're doing it while also being a woman. Um, and th not that there isn't sexism. I tell a lot of stories of sexism I've gone through, but that's not because I was in comedy. That's just because I'm a girl. Right. So fundamentally, one of the things you get at is what do people mean when they say you can't joke about that? Yeah. What people usually mean is they mean that this is a subject that is something that I don't want to think about. This is the subject that scares me. This is something dark. And my entire book argues that actually those subjects are the most important ones to joke about because of the healing power that they can kind of provide to some of the really, really dark stuff in life. And that's not to say that every joke has this healing power, right? Sometimes you'll just hear a joke and be like, ugh. But, you know, we can't make people too afraid to try. One of the things you said that was really interesting to me was there's like a, a talking point you'll hear people say where they're like, oh, well, I like offensive jokes, but they have to be funny. Right. And that's something that if somebody has said to me before reading your book, I probably would have said like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But you explained why that actually doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't make sense because humor is in the eye of the beholder, first of all. So what one person thinks is funny, another person might not. But also literally the one of the many terrifying things about comedy is you actually don't know if it's going to hit or not until you try it. And there's no other way except for that. Because obviously if you're making the joke, you think it's funny in your own head. Sometimes it's only funny to you. And if we make people too afraid to try, then we might, we won't get to those jokes that do really hit and do bring the healing to the darkness um, of those tough subjects. So it really it really kind of represents a complete misunderstanding of how comedy even works. And like, it's fine to be offended by a joke and to say, I'm, you know, that hurt my feelings. I didn't like that joke. It's completely another thing to be like, therefore, this person's irredeemable. Or this was an irredeemable sin. I, I go into the book right at the beginning about how intention should be the most important thing that we weigh. If someone was just trying to be funny or trying to make a joke, you should you can say your feelings were hurt. But keep in mind the way you respond, people are going to be paying attention. And that might discourage other people from wanting to make jokes about maybe other subjects in the future. Or that might be something that might help you someday. Yeah. And you talk about that talking point that people say, like, intent doesn't matter. You can right. picture it with the clappy hands emojis on yeah, social no. media, right? Like the social justice warriors or whatever. Say, well, it doesn't matter that it was a joke. It hurt the marginalized communities or whatever, or I felt triggered or I felt unsafe or these kinds of things. But I, it actually, intent does matter a lot, right? And yeah. you, you, you talk about our legal system in a way that I'd never thought about that. Yeah. I mean, if it matters when someone is killed, whether or not you planned out this murder and killed them on purpose versus like a vehicular manslaughter situation, how can it not matter when it comes to jokes, which I would say are always going to be less serious because nobody's dead in that situation. But people just kind of repeat this stuff and they kind of parrot this stuff without really thinking about it. And one of the personal stories that I share is when I went through this with the Jimmy Kimmel's family. Uh, the last time we did Gutfeld, this was the last time we did Gutfeld live. And I, I like rehashed this whole controversy in the book because uh, whatever, because I thought it really makes the point. And we were talking about he had taken some, this was in 2020, we were live. He had taken some time off to like spend time with his family. But I remember reading the article and I remember reading that everyone's OK, like there's nobody who's sick, whatever, anything like that. Everyone's fine. Um, I was taught we were talking about it and just off the f top of my head, I was thinking about giving my cat his heart medication before I left. And it's like 
I was joking around about how people with kids always think that like they can just have excuse to get out of anything, but it's way harder to give a feral cat medication. They have claws, blah, blah, blah. Greg is like, oh, I just want to remind you that his son has like a heart condition. And I didn't know that. And so I, I blacked out. Like I, rem- I remember being like, I'm sorry. And then in the next chance I had to speak in the next sentence, I was like, I'm so sorry if anybody thought I meant that. We never- I, I, but I, I blacked out the rest of the time. Like I was actually crying in all the breaks. I was like trying to get my mentee B. Like I was having a full on panic attack, but like somehow able to turn it off for the few minutes that I was on the air until I went home and, you know, took Xanax. And truly everything was fine though. Everything was fine. Everyone was like, we could tell you didn't mean it. Everyone who watched the show till the next day when I was at the vet actually with the cat, somebody had taken a little part of my clip and said, here she is, you know, making f- so me, I was like ridiculing because the kid had a heart condition. If I was doing that, I mean, everybody told me people were saying F-f-f off. Jimmy Kimmel's sister told me to kill myself. She said F-f-f off and die. If I was really, truly, truly doing that, I would deserve all those things. Like if I was actually trying to go after this family because there was a kid with a heart condition, then totally I should fuck like F-f-f off and all these die. All this is appropriate. This kind of outrage. It was a total accident. I was trying to make a joke that might be like relatable to other people who are childless and might, you know, have cats. But it t- intention didn't matter, right, to the mob. And it should have because not only does it, you know, hurt people more than what they deserve if they make a mistake or trying to make a joke, but it also really minimizes the really awful shit. Yeah, and and part of it's like proportionality. So to me, uh, I vaguely remember this controversy at the time because I followed you for many years, but then I yeah. was reading about it in the book. I actually listened to the audiobook, which I really liked that you actually recorded it. I love when yeah, authors record it in their own. I know it's a bitch to do, isn't it? It was a bitch. But it's <laughs> so worth it. It's so, especially like with somebody like you who does TV and so many of your fans will have watched you to then have the audiobook be read by some rando narrator would just yeah. not work. No. Um, but so, I'm hearing you rehash this and it just seems so immediately obvious to me that any like good faith observer to that would be like, oh, okay, she made a mistake. She's not an asshole. Right. They really discount this increasingly, right? The the cancel culture, the Twitter mobs. They they don't take into account intent. They don't take into account proportionality. I just covered a story where this Seattle Times reporter got fired for a tweet where they said he was defending Hitler and he was actually just saying Stalin is as evil as Hitler, basically. And he is his literally a descendant of concentration camp survivors. None of it mattered. And a few people on Twitter said he defended Hitler, which he did not do. And then the paper fired him. And it's like, I, I just don't know how we got to this point, especially online, where we're so quick to take people's words and strip them of all context and strip them of their intention because... You're absolutely right. The intention behind words totally transforms their meaning. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I write a couple chapters kind of about social media a little bit. I mean, at least part chapters about social media. And the fact that, you know, it is on social media and you don't have to actually face the person that you're piling on. I think that's part of it. It removes the human element of things. I think it's also really easy to do. All you have to do to kind of designate yourself as one of the good ones is just like quote tweet whatever people are getting dragged for and be like, wow, or like that. Like you don't have to get off the toilet. You know what I mean? And then you're like, oh, I'm so good. And it's horrible. And also there's some research in my that I um, cite in my book that shows that actually these algorithms, if you're talking in moral, emotional terms, like doing the grandstanding you actually get more attention on social media for those things, which is so much different than real life, though, right? Because if there was somebody who was acting like that every time you like had them at your party, you would stop inviting them to your party because it's not fun. So, but then we make decisions for real life when with people's employment, that kind of a thing, off of Twitter, when really it's not a representation of what real life actually is like and what people leave there it's it's so not um but it's so easy to, to just take people on judge them based on like one little thing right and i feel like people do that more and more now because even if somebody does tweet something bad or something offensive it may or may not be a reflection of who they are as a person and like the 
the penumbra of their life's work and their thinking and their philosophy. So to just take the worst moments from somebody and try to, I feel like that's, nobody wants that standard applied to them, but they're very quick to apply that to other people. Right. And you shouldn't want that standard applied to anyone because it changes the way that we kind of all talk to each other. Um, You know, for me, I think it's always been wrong the way we frame the debate. And that's what I think is one of the things that makes this book different, because a lot of the debate around speech is like there's speech on one side and then there's sensitivity on the other side. Right. I am an extremely sensitive person. I have so many feelings. I'm emotional. There's a huge difference between being emotional and sensitive and having feelings and expecting the world to revolve around your feelings, which is that selfishness, right? And when it comes to being sensitive, um, you know, I write about my mom dying when I was young, you know, I was young, she was young, she died pretty suddenly. And it was devastating. And it was made so much worse by the fact that I noticed people were nervous to talk to me. Like they were so scared of saying the wrong thing that it was like they couldn't talk to me at all. And so then in addition to being devastated, I also felt isolated. And, you know, I would I found humor to be helpful. My mom was joking as she was dying. So I would joke, you know, joke around. People would like shit on me or be like, "Ooh, like this too far. And it, like to who? You know what I mean? It's helping me. So I think that and I've talked to other people about this and they do agree that in a lot of times, these pressures to speak the right way actually hurt the people they're supposed to help in a lot of instances. Well, and you talk about that with trigger warnings, right? There's literally, yeah. these are supposed to help people with PTSD or trauma, but research shows they actually make it worse. Yeah. Yeah. At best, they do nothing or also possibly make it actually actively worse for these these specific people. And that research is out there. And yet you're a jerk if you don't give one. Um, it defies logic. And again, I don't think it's jerks on one side speech on the other. I am. I also think that, you know, there's a lot of talking over each other, you know, now and lobbing talking points at one another. And I really think that if we ever want to understand each other, we have to be able to express ourselves fully. And once we can express ourselves fully, um, you know, there's really no limits for how we can connect with the people around us. Because I first got the idea for this book and I write about my shit bag, <laughs> my chapter called shit bag. I had an emergency. I had a, a bowel perforation and I had an emergency ileostomy for five weeks, told pretty much nobody. Um, had it, And I had it reversed. But after my first surgery, my dad was like, Cat, like you're 32 years old. What have you not been through at this point? And I said, well, dad, I, you know, I was on oxy at the time because they do give you that when you have a surgery like that. But I was like, you know, well, every tough thing you go through, you're automatically building a connection with everyone who's been through it, too. And that was helpful to me. But then also the more I thought about it, I was thinking, you know, what's the use if we can't talk about it, which um, I think is one of the problems that we face now. I mean, do you think there's anything that's too offensive to joke about, talk about? I mean, we think about AIDS, the Holocaust, rape, some of the most horrific things in the human experience. I've also found them sometimes to be the most insightful and fertile, fertile ground for comedy. And obviously I don't do comedy, but some of the the best stuff I've ever seen seems to dive into the things that are like the most taboo to talk about or let alone joke about. Yeah, no, I actually I, I don't get into AIDS in the book. That's I think when I forgot, but I do literally directly address the Holocaust and rape, which are obviously not things that are funny. Right. When people say that, like rape's not funny. Well, like no shit. Right. Of course, it's not funny. But that doesn't mean that you can't joke about it. And part of the reason why I dedicated this book partially to my cat Sheens, but also to Joan Rivers, is she would joke about the darkest stuff in her life. I mean, she joked about her husband's suicide. She joked about the Holocaust. And when people went after her, she basically made the point of like, I'm not joking about this despite the fact that it was so horrific. I'm joking about it because it was so horrific. And she's trying to, you know, bring attention to it and these different kinds of things. Um yeah, just because a topic isn't funny, that doesn't mean that it's something you can't joke about. I mean, my near-death experience, I was joking the whole way through it. I never would have gotten through it otherwise. My mom's death, I was joking about it the entire time, never would have gotten through it otherwise. And again, that doesn't mean that you can't hear a joke and be like, hey, that hurt my feelings. But you you can't be saying that you can't joke about this subject because if you want something 
to be even scarier, you make it untouchable in your mind. And that gives it even more power than it already has. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But you talk about how you've joked about some of the most traumatic and upsetting things. Is that what you mean when you say comedy is my religion? Yeah. And I, yeah, I do because, so I used to be religious. I was very Catholic. I, I wish I could be religious again. I would love to think that, I read about this, I'd love to think that I'm something more than like an aging bag of blood and bones held together by a saint's skin sack. Like I, I would love, I'm agnostic. I just don't know. I'm a question mark, you know, and I would love to believe in that it's not just like me out here, you know, and that there is a higher power. But religion has offered what religion offers people comedy can offer a lot of the same things now not in terms of internal salvation but when you talk about the sense of community when you talk about the sense of providing meaning to horrific experiences also it activates a lot of the same things in the brain when you talk about you know oxytocin serotonin those sort of happy chemicals um there's actually a lot of things in common even healing, not only mentally, but physically also because of those. And there was a very small study, you know, albeit it was small, but I read about in the book that ranked humor about, you know, very sick people ranked it even higher than pain relief. Um, it, it, it really is something that's healing. It's, again, not a substitute for a traditional religion. But the one thing that is missing is forgiveness, I think, because... So, okay, I, again, I used to be religious, so I, I, I know all about the Bible. Um, Leviticus, easily one of the least chill books in the Bible, right? <laughs> like, right? You know, but the standard there still is like an eye for an eye. Now, if you think about comedy, um, you know, there is nobody who can earnestly tell you that on the list of the worst things they've been through in their lives, they put hearing a joke they didn't like anywhere near the top of that list. Some people might put having told the wrong joke on the top of their list or near the top of their list. So that means that we're actually treating jokes with a stricter standard than Leviticus, which to me means we're doing something wrong. Yes, it definitely does. And and that kind of brings us to the issues of cancel culture and free speech that you touch on in the book. But one thing that interests, I mean, interested me is You've had some run-ins with this, right? People, uh, but some of them surprised me. Like, so what did you do to piss off Star Wars fans? This was my biggest scandal that I ever had. I was on Red Eye. All I said was that I'd never seen Star Wars because I was too busy liking cool things and being attractive, Um, which is a joke, Red Eye, haha, but it struck a nerve, right? Because this guy, it was fine for like a month. And then some like super nerd made this YouTube video shitting on me showing my comments and then he did like a slideshow of hot chicks wearing star wars t-shirts i think i guess in an aim to like fact check what i had said fact check your well, joke <laughs> yeah my joke i was like getting death threats and i want to i want to make sure i make the distinction between death threats and death suggestions it wasn't die bitch i wish you would die i was getting emails like i will be at your house at eight there's nothing you can do i'll be in yeah, like truly, like I had to get the police involved. Like it was a big deal. But some advice whenever I freak out about something I said in the air, Gottfeld's always like, don't worry about it because it's never going to be the thing you think it's going to be. And it's he's right. But I also after that, I wrote another article being like, I'm not sorry because I wasn't sorry. And I don't I think that oversaturating with apologies we don't mean is bad. But even recently, I had another the Jason Aldean thing. I got like I had like I made it like a and I was actually making a comment. What I said was it sucks that everything's so political right now that like I can't just, you know, say that I don't like the songs. I don't like new country music. And like I'm not a fan. I don't really know who he is. To me, he looks like every other guy sitting at the bar to Buffalo Wild Wings. And that was like people were like really fast. (laughs) Like people were like it was like actually probably the biggest controversy I had in years, even as I was making the point of like I can't even say that like this thing anymore. Also, like I wasn't shitting on Buffalo Wild Wings. I wasn't. I was making. They a are point, ass. If we're being honest, where is it now? Right. I guess I was right. Yeah. No. <laughs> I, I I totally. I found that hilarious. It never is the thing you think. No. I've had uh, exactly two moments that I was on television go viral, and neither one was anything like I ever would have expected. Or was it my hot take? I was. I knew I was going on to say something controversial. Right. It was always just something that happened. Uh, off the cuff. But 
I am concerned about the direction of the cancel culture and free speech stuff in both directions, right? I think there's culturally right now, the right talks more about free speech as a positive good. And the left talks more about like, hate speech is not free speech. But I still think the right does a fair bit of cancel culture. And you actually made me reconsider something. Kathy Griffin, who uh, famously posed like artistically as a form of comedy, I guess, with a fake chopped off Donald Trump head. Was she unfairly canceled? See, she wasn't just, uh, yes, because she wasn't just canceled. Like she was on a no fly list, right? That's, that part is crazy. <laughs> like it's crazy. And I remember I was on TV talking about this and I was like, look, I thought what she, I, I didn't like it, what she did. I thought it was gross. I didn't like it. But that all that doesn't mean like that she should be prosecuted, which is what actually people on the right, I saw calling for that, you know, for her to be actually criminally prosecuted. Um, which that we nobody should want that. Nobody should want that because the main purpose of the First Amendment, obviously, is you do have the freedom to speak out against the government without any retaliation from the government. And what she was doing was an art piece. It was supposed to be a play on the comments he made, like blood coming out of her where I've whatever when he was talking about Megan Kelly. Um, it didn't hit. Right. It obviously didn't hit. Um, but this is a woman who I think she, when she won her Emmy, she got on stage and was like, suck it, Jesus. This award is my God now or something like that. Like, that's her thing. She's deliberately controversial. Um, I happen to have loved her show, My Life on the D-List. And to act as though she should be, you know, none of us really ever thought that the, you know, star of My Life on the D-List was going to kill the president. Nobody ever thought that. So I think that nuance is missing a lot of things you'd be like hey i didn't like it but she doesn't need to be prosecuted or i didn't like i mean what happened to her was like crazy and her I career mean, was kind of ruined everything. almost right and, and the, yeah and then the fact that you know if you want to say i don't like her i still support that she went too far that's yucky what she, for me if it's attention is always a joke my rules i'm always gonna have your back because having comedy and you know the freedom to speak out and 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 be able to fail and not be like not welcome in the public square anymore. That's always to me going to rank higher than my my need to be like, I didn't like it. And this was gross for this and this. Like, I, I don't ever really want to see someone canceled if they were just trying to like make a joke or if it was art of some kind. I don't ever really want to see that. Um, especially I hated seeing conservative. And again, I said it was gross. I didn't like it. Um just to, I, I just really seeing a sort of say like she should be like prosecuted. She should be on the no fly list. Like she, like bro, like no, no, she shouldn't. No, it, like it clearly wasn't intended as like an actual threat, right? And, and that's they, what people intent matters, right? Uh, yeah, and, yeah. And she was going for a joke. It wasn't funny. It was, I think, gross. But yeah, and, I didn't find it funny at all. I, yeah, mm. you're right. I should say I didn't find it funny. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it is in the eye of the beholder. Um, but. Yeah, I find it the path we're going down on these issues of speech and cancel culture is just not great. I mean, you talk about one thing I didn't know was going on in the book, which is these shows. So obviously, social mores change over time. I grew up, I was a big Glee fan. Did you ever watch a Glee? Mm-mm. Okay, Good. well, Glee was at the time like a radically progressive show, right? It had gay characters who were out right. and everything. You watch it back now, and it's wildly offensive. They make jokes about people with special needs. They make race jokes. They say uh, they do all sorts of things that would get them instantly canceled in 2023. And so the, the, the social mores change, but like I watch it back now and I think about those things. Oh, why our, our thinking on that issue has kind of collectively changed. We don't say the word retarded anymore, right? I grew up where I grew up. People said that all the time in Boston. Right. And I years ago took that out of my vocabulary for obvious reasons. But it's like these things change, yet we we should acknowledge the change. Apparently, you you write about how shows are like deleting old episodes, digitally erasing them to eliminate problematic things they did. Yeah. I there a lot of it happened in the summer of 2020 where they were deleting entire episode. I mean, I think in one case, there was a whole series. The stuff was just gone. And I think that there's a lot of people who can agree that that's 
bad because unless your aim is to delude, that information should be there, right? So that we can, even if it's, you know, like you said, standards have changed or norms have changed, they still brought us to where the past still brought us to where we are now, you know? And I thought it was really interesting. So as I was writing it, um, there was a, a woman who was talking about an episode of How I Met Your Mother where this character was in yellow face and all the episodes gone and we can't talk about it. And actually, she was wrong about which character it was. I mean, there was some characters that had like the kung fu mustaches on or whatever else, but it wasn't the character she named. It's because the episode is gone. And my editor even pointed that out to me and I went back and looked for it. So it's like, all going to be retelling we can't have could you even find it anywhere i i wasn't able to i was able to see i I even like wrote in my book i got this from this website where they did you know um but but also there's people who are experts in the field of this who say that the technology is newer and likely these things are going to some of these things will probably be lost forever And that is just robbing us of being able to have a conversation about things that happened in the past, which brought us to where we are now. And again, more information is always going to be a good thing and a helpful thing, unless what you want to do is delude people or try to, you know, remove your own responsibility. Yeah. And it's a little Orwellian, like that's thrown around a lot, but they had the um, the ministries, right, rewriting the history books to change yeah. what history happened. And if we're going to start deleting things, erasing them from the face of the earth that were problematic now, I mean, how long is it going to be before we collectively misremember what exactly. reality was, what history was? I think that's kind of crazy. Yeah, I think it's absolutely crazy. And I don't understand how it's progressive. It's really just wanting to lie to people. Um, you know, if you don't feel good about it, you can always like add something to the episode, like if you want, you know, but removing it, you're just pretending that the whole show was something different than what it really was. Even by removing one episode, you're saying, oh, we're a show that never did, for example, Blackface, right? Like the, the example of 30 Rock. Um, okay, well, you did. And at the time, everyone was fine with it. Now, people aren't. And you're not able to point that shift if everything is gone. Isn't it interesting, though, because something like blackface, which I think we all agree shouldn't be done now. But at the time when 30 30 Rock did it, nobody was offended at the time. And so, no, it's not like there were black people, or at least not very many, who were outraged at the time and whose lives were meaningfully harmed. But today, you might see someone canceled for something they did decades ago, like blackface that's now offensive, and they might lose work, they might lose opportunities, with seemingly no reflection on the fact that it didn't actually hurt anybody at the time. Like, it wasn't received by anyone negatively at the time, so we're now retroactively policing behavior for harm that wasn't even harmful at the time. That doesn't make any sense to me. And it doesn't make any sense to delete it because, you know, then you're saying, oh, this this never happened, right? When it did happen. And it's actually gotten more extreme, I would even say, than just, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, so Teen Vogue, um, I think her name was Alexi McCammond. I don't remember oh, exactly. Yeah. But I write about it. She was supposed to, She was supposed to be the editor of Teen Vogue. And then, you know, it came out that she had said some made some racially insensitive tweets about Asian people when she was a teenager. And she'd already apologized for these years prior. We already all knew that this had happened. Right. But she would already apologize. It got brought up again. And she never, you know, never even got to start the job because of this, basically. And But then one of the other one of the people uh, who was an Asian girl who was, you know, leading the charge and upset about this. Her old tweets, she used the N word. So it's like, why? That's why would you, knowing that you did that, be going after somebody else? Maybe that's why. That Maybe that, that is why. I. But it blow again. It's and 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 you know, I, I write about this too. That there are studies, there are actual surveys done ac- about many different issues, and what it shows that across various demographics, what people believe. And what people say they believe, there'll be these huge gaps between the two things. So we've all kind of created this culture that only exists in terms of like the lies that we keep telling to prop it up. 
because people are like, oh, I don't want to get canceled. So I better act like I'm really upset about this or I might be like, like I'm really upset. about." It. And now we are all living in a culture that doesn't match the values in a lot of cases that we actually hold. Yeah. I mean, I remember my days at UMass, which is a very left wing uh, college. I, I've always been a little bit of an attention whore, a little bit of a contrarian. I always like to debate. Pain. Yeah. So <laughs> I would go 1v20 in class, like debating affirmative action. I think it's harmful or whatever. And then I would, after class, have people come up to me and say, thank you for speaking out. I agreed with you. I'm so glad you said what you said. And I'd be like, that's great. But where were you? I could have used a little backup in there. And they go, well, I don't want my friends to hate me. And I'm yeah. like, come on, people. You got to, at some point, you got to get in the ring. You got to stand up for what you believe. But do you get do you get any of that? Do you get like quiet Fox News fans who like clearly yeah. <laughs> don't tell their friends they watch you? Well, yes, I do, including like some celebrities, like I'm, you know, like actual so who like have like DM me and they, I'm just so funny, but like they won't ever, you know, have me on their podcast or like publicly admit because I'm work at Fox News and therefore I'm like shameful <laughs> as a human being. Truly. And it's crazy because, um, you know, I I love I love working here because, for one thing, on Gutfeld, it's like I'm exactly myself. I never voted for Trump ever. I never voted for a Democrat ever either. I've always voted Libertarian. Um, you know, I am an individual. Like it's not a monolith here. There's various individuals who work here. But also it it like it drives me nuts. Like it, it really does. It's like, okay, you know what I mean? And um I I've told that joke before like when I've met just like random people at a party or like at a bar that you'll never see a guy when they ask me what I do for a living, I'll just say porn. And because it's less controversial. <laughs> That's hilarious. And you know, and it's like people will get mad. Oh, and it's like, well, what have I actually said that upset you? And it's like it's it's just so crazy. And the amount of people who have said that they think that I'm funny or have told friends of mine who people who are like publicly friends with me, like, oh, cat's so funny, but don't tell anyone. Or I like cat, don't tell anyone. It's like you guys like grow up. I just wouldn't want to live that way. Like, I'd rather be canceled and actually own my like, I, I think that's such a spineless way to go through life. I mean, yeah. And it's like, so I, you know, I, I obviously working here, like I have friends, like I, I work with a lot of people who did vote for Trump, right? And like also like that's a, like millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of people. And I'm just, for me, it's not like the enough to completely say another human being is completely irredeemable and not worthy of any consideration on any topic or issue or even my kindness because of who they voted for. No, absolutely not. And it's all, it's all. How is that a radical take? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but it's also strange because literal Democrats work at Fox News, right? Like any news yeah, network, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fox employs yeah. people from both sides of the spectrum, yeah, uh, including people who are solidly progressive. So just to hear, oh, you work at Fox News, you must be, yeah, the weather people at Fox News are really evil, yeah. right? Like it's just this reductive way that people have it looking the first of all, I don't I don't I wouldn't have any judgment anyway but like even if you were to broadly apply that judgment is just so reductive it it really is and you know it's like one thing for people to be like oh I just assumed like whatever but it's another thing to be like don't tell anybody because I find you shameful because the way you think you know I guess yeah it's, it's so thanks for the compliment and then the, you know, letting me know that you would never claim me in public. <laughs> I've had some very like prominent like gay YouTubers or gay influencers who like follow me or have messaged me or something and tell me they like my content, but have never liked a single one of my videos. And I'm like, yeah, I think I know what's going on here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's like I am a lot of people's like not in the sex way, but like the way the kids use sneaky link like it's like that in terms of content not sex it's like people will like watch my videos and then like dm me about them but like they won't follow me they won't like them because they don't want people to know and i'm like you guys like and it's a lot of people like it's actually a, a like a lot of people that's that's honestly as depressing to me as anything you wrote about in the book i mean <laughs> yeah, i don't think you talked about that in the book but maybe you should no, have. i'm not gonna name drop it i'm not i'm not gonna i'm not gonna expose any of you for like 
liking liking the, my content, but it's also like, you know, get over it. Yeah, it is sad to be so because you're afraid you'll lose friends. I don't know if those people are your friends if they would right. if they would just cut you off. I mean, I guess I understand people are worried about their livelihood, but like. God forbid someone knows you follow Cat Tim. It's not like you're exactly yeah. most polemic person on TV, right? <laughs> no, I'm no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know, but it's a thing. Yeah. So, how's the reception? So, I from what I've seen, your book's been a big hit. But have you gotten any like I know uh, even books by people on the right that are like a huge hit will sometimes get the cold shoulder from like left of center media or podcasts or anything. Have you have you gotten? any reception because i feel like there's things in your books they should like if they're open to it that's the thing is i you know the books honestly been doing very well i wanted to do even better because i do think that there's a lot of people who would really like it who might be under the false impression that this is a book that's like the woke left is ruining comedy it's not about that this is a book about being a human being and having trauma and how comedy can be healing from that trauma and also how being open about everything, you know, that you're comfortable being open about at least and, and listening to each other brings people together. And, you know, it's a human book about human stuff. There's only one political chapter. and It's literally called Sorry, This One's About Politics. I did got, you know, I got I got to go um, on Bill Maher, which was awesome. So I did get to do some things that are not typical, like obviously right wing media. I did a uh, Dr. Drew After Dark, I uh, taped that and I think it comes out at the end of August. And I'm very excited about that one. But I, you know, I, I really think that this issue is 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 super important. And I think that the book is it's it's not if you think, you know, like you kind of said, it's like it's not what you expect. It certainly wasn't what I expected. I really encourage people to check it out. The link will be in the description below. But Kat, thank you so much for your time and for coming on the podcast. Thank you. It was so great to talk to you. I'm really glad you enjoyed the book. Um, and, you know, I, I really I poured a lot of myself out there. Uh, I know when Guy Benson on the radio, he had an advanced copy he interviewed me. He's like some of this stuff. I'm like, is she sure she wants to tell people this stuff? And you know what? I kind of wasn't sure. Uh, some of this stuff I sent it to the editor be like, this is the best piece of writing. And then it like hit me later. People are going to read this. But I didn't want to kind of make the case for you can joke about anything and not leave some of my own like most embarrassing, humiliating trauma that could have been used to make the point better. I don't want to leave that stuff behind. So he was like, I know a lot of people, you know, the people on TV, common wisdom is like, you want to keep your image up. And like, I'm like, no, I just I expose myself a lot. So, well, if you want to see Kat expose herself, yeah, book. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much.